Welcome to the Cranocast. My name's Rich Hyden. I'm the community archaeologist here at the Scottish Cranock Centre, and this is... My name's Jason, and I work at the Scottish Cranock Centre, and I have many roles here, um, but I especially enjoy experimental archaeology as a way of coming to understand the past. Brilliant. And today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at, as we'll do regularly, a, a different parts of the collection. Um, today, our focus is mostly on ironwork specifically, yeah. metalwork as a whole, but ironwork specifically. Um, and we're going to take what is quite a unremarkable to some, maybe part of the collection, which is the iron slag, which was found. Um, and we're going to talk about, well, simply what it is. So, so I mean, Jason, you can start. What is it? In principle? So slag is a byproduct of iron production. Um, it is the uh, the thing that kind of indicates that you are making iron and it builds up in the bottom of the furnace. And um, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about how you actually make iron. But yeah, th this is the this is a byproduct. This is the thing that's left. Um, so I think that's kind of a broad overview of what that is. But that indicates to us that people are making iron in this area. Um, this is not necessarily a thing that would be bought from somewhere else like maybe a piece of jewelry or a bead this indicates that they were making iron kind of in latte and specifically around oak by Cranach. yeah so this um there's it's not just this one single bit we've got a, a number of different pieces of slag found on, on oak bank Cranach, but it was found on on the Cranach site in the mound of material in the waste as it was and its presence, as you've just said, is clearly defining that we have iron working mm. going on. So if we if we take a step back and we think about what is this actually telling us about the Iron Age people at the Cranog, mm. if in simple terms, where you find iron slag, you find iron working. Um, we're talking about how, in principle, because it is simply put a waste product. Yeah. It doesn't move. It's it's the posh archaeological term is it's taphonomy. You know, how does it end up being from used by the people two and a half thousand years ago to ending up in the ground where we have found it two and a half thousand years later? And in the case of this, it would have in principle yeah. in principle a very, very localized <laughs> um deposition which is just a silly way of saying that basically it's not going to get thrown away miles and miles and miles away from where it was made initially yeah. okay and that's quite important because for us to understand oak bank cranog having this on site in some ways is more valuable for us as archaeologists to understand iron working than finding for instance the iron knife yeah and actually, the iron knife that was found is grand, but I could give that to you and you could give that to another member of staff and they could travel 3,000 miles yeah. and that could be passed on. That, as a process, could be quite far and wide, whereas this is very localised and it means that it was happening on site. So, iron smelting. It's a byproduct of iron smelting, so how do we end up with iron smelting? So, what what... What is the process? Okay. Want to take us through it, Jason? Yeah, so there are lots of processes involved with this, um, but I think I just want to key into something that you said right at the very beginning about that it was found on the site of Oak Bank Cranach. But I think where it was found is really important because the smelting, before we get into the detail of that, would be probably happening on the land. Mm -hmm. You are not going to be probably smelting iron on the cranic in a wooden house so you're going to be doing it on the land mm -hmm. and yet the slag was found underneath the cranic which is i don't know x amount of meters out yeah. into the water so why have a byproduct of something somewhere it really doesn't belong or it doesn't it doesn't mm -hmm. come from there mm -hmm. if you found it on the land that would be an indication of where it might have been yeah but the fact it was carried out onto the cranic why was that what was the meaning of that? That's something we'll never know about. No. So it's telling us where the iron was made, yeah. but why was it there? So in terms of smelting, um, you need a number of skills. 
first of all, you need community wisdom, and that is uh, how you source the clay. So in order to make a, a furnace, you need a significant amount of clay, which you're going to fashion into a chimney. The clay around here is very crumbly. There are different types of clay. There's blue clay and there's yellow clay. They're both very, very different. And you would need something to carry the clay in because you're maybe going to need 20 kilos of clay. Mm -hmm. So you are going to need baskets and you're going to need the resources to uh, make your baskets. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to need the basket weavers. Mm -hmm. So before you even gather the clay, all of a sudden you are tapping into um, a wider community effort, um, a wider community skill level. Um, mm -hmm. Then you collect the clay, you bring it back to where you want to make your furnace. You're then going to mix that up with manure. You Maybe you're going to mix that up with sand. So that would suggest that you are near animals. And of course, the people on the Kranich, we think they had cows on the Kranich. So you're going to be mixing it up with the manure. You might be mixing it up with um, old furnaces. Um, some grog, some old pottery. So everything now at the moment is pointing towards pottery. You will then shape that into a furnace. You then need to make the bellows, which will be made from leather. So again, that's linking into farming. Um, and you're going to need people that are good at carving, shaping wood. And those people will need um, tools in order to cut the trees down. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about this object. It's about the impact of iron production in a certain area. And that's really only scratching the surface. Yeah. So there is also an inherited wisdom. Um, there is inherited knowledge with iron production. It is very, very difficult to do. You would also need to be uh, doing forest management to make charcoal, for example. Um, so you're going to get people skilled at making charcoal. Once you have all these items, then you need to find your bog iron which we found nearby. So um, under a layer of, uh, it looks like iron pan actually, which is a result of deciduous trees dropping their leaves. And it, anyway, that contributes to creating this, this thin layer of iron pan, which you can dig out of the landscape. You crumble it down. You then layer that in your furnace, which looks like a big chimney. Um, then you light a fire in the bottom and then you bellow for, I don't know, six to eight hours. At that point, you need people who have skill in observing the temperature, people being able to read the temperature. If you bellow too hard, um, you're going to end up with steel. You will not be able to give that to the blacksmith. So this piece of slag here uh, really connects to how people are interacting with the landscape, to each other, with other community skills, with inherited wisdom, possibly with apprenticeships. Um, knowledge of the local landscape, knowledge of geology. So it, it creates a much bigger picture than we have a piece of slag in front of us. What do you think about that, Rich? Yeah, I think it's, it, it, yeah. I mean, I just very quickly there, as you were going through, made a list of writing down everything that you said was needed and to break it down into a really simple list. To end up with this waste product, you need basket weaving, clay working, animal husbandry, bellow making, leather working, wood working, charcoal production, coppicing, iron ore mining, smelting itself, iron working, to follow that afterwards. Yeah. So although what you've got here is just one waste product, what you've also got here is you said it's a whole community that's investing it. And again, it's taking the, the process of just understanding that what you've got is not, it's not just a bit of rubbish. No. You actually start to piece apart how that's created. Although yeah. this isn't the intended product, mm. it is the byproduct of all of that that we've just mentioned falling in. But I think when you take take the Iron Age of Mock Tay as a concept, um, we talk about you know uh, an environment of lots of different people. Um, we think about it being quite populated, not you know yeah. sparse and barren, and these are skilled individuals. If one thing can kind of encapsulate the fact that there would have had to have been an in, industrial is a terrible word to use, but uh, an industry that's set up, this is one of those things that actually I think it, it for me, when talking to visitors at the Crown Centre especially, it allows me to encapsulate the fact that 
this isn't just a family of people in the Iron Age living on a roundhouse over the water. Mm. As you said, this, this was not found up in the mountain. This was not mm. found 35 miles down the river. Mm. This was found on Loch Tay, on mm. a building out over the water that is next to the shore. I think with that being in principle, you're throwing your waste and your rubbish away quite locally. Yeah. It helps us look at this industry. And it's not, in a way, it, we were talking before before we started the recording about the tangible and the intangible with this. Mm. There, there is the intangible and the uncertainty that, that surrounds anything prehistoric. Yeah. Why is the slag out on the Cranog being thrown there? Why is it not on the land? There's an uncertainty there. But there is a certainty that to achieve this, yeah. you've got everything that you've just mentioned. And they're yeah. all kind of fixed that that has to happen yeah and that's not going to be widespread it's not going to be mm. happening one in aberdeen one in yeah. inverness one down in the borders one in cornwall this is happening yeah fairly localized i think that that's a fair yeah. assumption it yeah. might be an assumption but i think it's a fair assumption to make would you agree yeah i would absolutely and all you need is this um and i think it's I think one of the other things I think is really interesting about iron production is that all of a sudden the production of metal becomes democratised as well. Mm. So I think this also shows that maybe there has been societal shifts as well, just from this. Mm. Um, the fact that people can make this um, means that people from their local area can make a metal that is usable for them. They're not having to maybe rely on the trade of tin, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it shows a, a cultural shift as well. So again, I think that lives in, that links into the um, the I think intangible nature of uh, how this connects to the landscape and how this connects to other people. So I'm wondering if on the rest of the cranics in uh, Loch Tay, the other sixteen cranics, would you find a similar thing, or does this indicate that maybe the people who are on Oak Bank Cranic were specialists in uh, iron production? Yeah, we don't know. So I think it'd be interesting yeah. to also connect it to the other cranics. What were people on the yeah. other cranics doing? Would this be a similar find? It starts. It starts then. To, I think to fold into that question that you you've you've pulled before. It, it's the more interesting is not why did people build cranogs, but there's that question that follows on from it, which I think is is much more deeper. We still don't have the answer to it, by the way. But it's much more deeper in that it's not why they build a cranog, but what was it about these people? Yeah. That means they could build the crown or What was it about these individuals that means they were the ones out on the building? There's something that marks them apart. We've talked yeah. before, and in the past podcast, talked about the, the textile. We've talked before in the past podcast about farming, you know. Yeah. But actually, we we talk about metal working and iron working. But from what you said before, it's actually starting to ask me that question is not maybe why is it just the iron working? Yeah. But also, is it everything that we've just mentioned? Yeah. You know, there's a whole there's a whole connectivity of the different crafts here. Yeah. And we, we, we marcate them into different crafts. We want to break them up and talk about them. But actually, I think you were talking before about how, how much more connected they are. I think it would be an interesting process to actually... Because I think we've got a piece of the furnace here as well. It looks. Does it look like the inside of the furnace to you? That piece of white clay, with the really heavy inclusions. And the, yeah. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. yeah. I think you know it's, so I, I it's big enough. Be, it's coarse enough. I think it'd be interesting to actually go out, have a look at where you find bog iron. You find that up on Drummond Hill, and mm -hmm. it drips out the landscape. It just looks like red treacle dripping from the landscape. Um, where do they get the amount of um, the bog iron from? So you're going to yeah. need maybe. 10 kilos of it to make a small piece of iron. Um, have a look at the uh, also the iron pan as well that's sitting above the clay. Is that what people might have used in the past? What exactly were they using? And then try and replicate this process, or well, not replicate it, but how are we going to move the clay from where the clay was found to where we're going to make the furnace? Yeah. How are we going to move the bog on? How are we going to shift it? What problems are we going to encounter? What resources do we need? How do we build the furnace? What happens there? What happens when it starts cracking? Because we're not using kind of modern plastic clay. All these kind of things I think would probably uh, give us more questions and I think open up more areas of uncertainty 
and research. I think that'd be something that'd be really interesting to do, possibly over at our new site at Dalherb, mm. because we're going to be closer to where people are actually living. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's, it's that uncertainty isn't a you know bad thing. No, it's not at all. That, that actually can help us by opening that discussion. You know, we could find out other ways of making this. Yeah. And how do you get slag that's that's so close to what it is? The one thing I would say is that this piece here, just bringing it back to the artifact um, itself, artifact's a strong word, the byproduct of the smelting, is this has a, and we were chatting about this before, Jason, is it has this kind of bubble on the side, which, yeah. which actually would indicate potentially that what we've got here is um, a piece of, of perhaps what they call tap slag. Yeah. And if it is, if it is indeed tap slag, this means that the furnace set up. So to go through this very quickly, they would have had, as you said before, the what was the word you used? A chimney like? Yeah, like a chimney. Yeah. yeah. It's a good way of describing it. It's not very high. Bellows providing air, filled with charcoal, ramped up, heating up to 1400 degrees potentially, yeah. and maintaining that temperature for the seven hour process plus, yeah. depending how much you're putting in. I mean, that's intense work. That's a lot of physical work. And we've both ourselves done, done yeah. iron smelting and can attribute to the fact that it's, it's, it's a commitment at the yeah. end of the day. It's not something you just tinker away with. You start the process, seven hours later, minimum, potentially, you're finishing the process. Yeah. Um, but what you're doing is you're adding your iron ore into the top. These temperatures aren't making your iron liquid. So we're not melting the iron off we're melting all the, the rock off that's yeah. what you've got here this is the slag it's that molten rock however that builds up and builds up and builds up in the furnace so if you've got your, your, your chimney it's a good word i like that word chimney yeah as time goes on if you're using very impure iron ore yeah and um, we talk about using bog iron locally up yeah. in the hills here what do you, do you have any idea i don't know what percentage it is around there i have absolutely no idea Cool. So that's something that we need to do. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and we need to, we need to go out and look at that, yeah. But if it's a very low percentage, say it's 5%, which would be yeah. probably quite a good percentage around here, that's 95% getting melted off. Yeah. That's going to fill up and fill up and fill up. And then you can choke your furnaces by having yeah. too much of this waste product filling up. So by seeing this little bubble, it, that's an important part because if that's flowing or that's flowing away, it actually means that while it's hot, not while it's cool, mm. while it's hot, they're taking the side of the furnace off or they're removing a part of the furnace and then this is going to be flowing away. It's going to be pouring out and leaving. Yeah. So actually that that gives us a, a, an insight that these furnaces are functional. They're designed. Yeah. And if this is taps like they're actually going to have, not doors, don't think like a hinge, but, you know, <laughs> an arch that we can remove part of the furnace yeah. wall and drag out all this molten. It's like lava. That's probably yeah. the best way of describing it, the lava that comes out. And then you're just pulling that away, shutting it, filling it back up, ramping it up again and keeping it going. So there's little indications. Again, it's just waste product. But this little pour off here, it's what? Not even an inch in what diameter or an inch in length, but just because of its shape and the fact that it is, instead of it just being spongy, gunky mess it's like a poured off bowl yeah so there's there's a lot more to learn i think there is and the only way to do that is that is really using your side of it jason which is the experimental archaeology yeah it's to try and experiment with these things and the fact is we may not end up with this at all and they end up with something completely different yeah and that helps us to answer the question that they maybe didn't do it that yeah. way um, but once all this is finished and once all this yeah. is done and we've finished and we've got the, the, the bloom, as yeah. we call it, which is the spongy iron, we would take this out, yeah. huge set of tongs, remove the, the spongy iron, and that's where the next step comes in, which yeah. I think we maybe haven't really addressed so far, which is once you've done all this work to get your iron bloom, there's no point in just getting an iron bloom. Yeah, that's great. But then you actually need to give that to someone. Yeah. And that someone would be a blacksmith. And we have been chatting to Tom, who came to our Kelso coming event. And uh, Tom is a blacksmith 
and sat down with him and talked about the iron knife as well. Yeah. Um, and gone through what, what he thought it might have been in the process. And he talked a little bit about slag too as well. So I'm sat here with Thomas Timbrell, who is a blacksmith, and he is part of our Celtic Coming event, um, which we've been running for the past two days. And Tom has been demonstrating to the public um, blacksmithing as a blacksmith. Um, what I wanted to do, Tom, was sit down with you today and just get your... Well, first of all, introduce yourself. What do you do? Uh, so, yeah, uh, so I'm a uh, professional blacksmith who mm -hmm. specialises as a historic cutler and bladesmith. So essentially I look at knives and bladed tools from throughout history. I recreate them as close to the original as possible for use in experimental archaeology or uh, collections in museums to give us a better idea of what those items were actually like and if they were any good. Yeah, brilliant. And uh, this weekend you've been demonstrating to the public. Um, what is it you've been making as part of Cal's Company? So, uh, using my Iron Age forge, my pit forge, um, we've been working at ground level with essentially a very basic setup, um, but one that is interpreted from what we can see in the archaeology uh, in Iron Age Britain uh, to create uh, different tools. Um, the main focus has been on knives, mm -hmm. um, showing people the kind of the amount of work that goes into forging them uh, and all the different techniques and processes in that creation. Um, uh, a couple of little arrowheads, fun yeah. things, pins, decorative yeah. items, yeah. Um, but, but mostly it's always around uh, domestic tools and equipment. Yeah. So in terms of the, the Cranog collection as it is, we've got on our, in our, from our excavation, should I say, we've got a number of different um, hints and, and, and kind of uh, indications of metalwork going on, both bronze, but also in your case with the iron or, or the very mild seal, whatever it might be. Um, in terms of that, we've got a handful of things. We've got a little iron knife. We call it an iron dagger. Mm. It doesn't have a handle. It doesn't have a tip. I believe in the past you thought it might not be a dagger. Um, but it's only about, what's that? I think it's about nine centimetres long in total. I've done your homework. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of that, what, what, when you look at that piece and, and if, if a visitor was to see that piece, what, what, would you, what would you describe that piece as or, or its function? I mean, it is a fantastic small little blade. Um, again, it's this thing of it, it's, it's, it's quite small, fairly corroded. What is left? What was it before? It, was it a dagger? I mean, it seems very small to be one. Um, however, we're looking at an item that was probably used for many years and it didn't start its life like that. Yeah. So over the years, it could have worn down, broken, uh, and eventually just become a small utility knife for yeah. someone until eventually it was chucked. Um, potentially, it could have been a tanged javelin head, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of other examples, but the typology of the blade, um, it does hold similarities with some knives and some larger daggers yeah. uh, from across the entire Britain. Yeah, brilliant. So that's one of the pieces, the, the, the finished product as it is. But again, with Oakbank Cranog specifically, with the archaeology, what we're, what we're incredibly gifted with is not just the final product, but evidence of the production itself. Um, and what we've got on our, on our site is, is a handful of, of very high ceramics and pottery as it is, with stuck bits of, of what we would call slag. It's, it's mm. the molten rock but um yeah in terms of that what what in terms of the slag what what would that tell us about about the smith or the or the, or the smelter itself well with uh when you do find uh metalworking slag especially uh produced from iron smelting that's mm -hmm. usually um one of the great indications that some form of iron working was taking place on site and depending on the type of slag and how it's formed it could indicate either it was iron smelting or it could indicate iron working if it was like at the base of a uh, forge. So what's the difference um, between those two types? Usually it would, uh, well, it would come down to the impurities and generally quantity as well. Mm -hmm. um, you would expect to find larger clumps from smelting processes. Mm -hmm. um, we would hope we would also find the bowl of the furnace or the base of the furnace to go with that as well. Um, whereas with iron working alongside smaller amounts of slag um, different types of impurities and uh, quant uh, elements with inside yeah. of it, 
Um, we would hope to find also a lot of uh, forge scale surrounding mm. the area as well. Um, but at any rate, regardless of which you have, even if it's out of context, it does give you an idea that there was some form of uh, iron working or iron production taking place on site. And the reason for that is because basically slag's a, a, it's a waste product. Yeah. Um, so unlike our knife, and that's where the two really do differ, is the knife, I could give you a knife. Mm. You sell knives, as you know. You're, you're thoroughly aware of this. You could sell a knife. That knife could be passed on and passed on and passed on. And as that's passed on, people still have the function, they still have the use for it. But fundamentally, that slag has no function, it has no mm. use. So there's no, well, I would say there's no legs to it. So yeah. it doesn't move, it doesn't get passed around. It uh, will get regard. chucked out maybe, it may have fallen no further than yeah. where the actual work was yeah, happening. So yeah. where you find it is where it's probably Absolutely. Perfect. So that's actually great evidence for us to understand, you know, that. And pulling back from that, if you need to smell iron, What's, what do you need to do that? Because obviously it's not just, it doesn't just come out of the ground. It does, no, it it's, <laughs> uh, in very rare cases, yeah, you might get iron nicely formed for you, but it's uh, fairly rare. What you would uh, instead be doing is you would be smelting, so you'd be gathering up your iron ore, which is uh, a rock that's really easy to identify, mm -hmm. generally quite a red colour yeah. and weighty. So yeah. you can gauge just how much iron is in some of it by the weight. Um, you would need to build yourself a furnace, whether you're doing that with some form of clay or daub. Um, you would also need uh, a fair amount of charcoal as well. Yeah. Um, and you would ideally be trying to source all those materials from as close as possible yeah. to then have that process um, going on. Interestingly, within Britain, um, with iron smelting, doesn't always mean there's immediately also iron working in the same location. Okay. So you could find that your area where you're, you find evidence of smelting, they're just producing iron, yeah. and then ingots or billets of the iron is being taken out and worked elsewhere. Okay. And likewise, they won't smelt the iron, they'll just turn it into objects. Just into objects. So you get this, you can potentially get an interconnectivity between other locations as well. That's interesting, because I, I kind of always worked on, on an assumption a little bit, I suppose, that actually with iron, once it's hot, you work it while it's hot, and the hottest mm. it's going to be is when it comes out of the smelter. And obviously, you've got a, you've got a. So, so as it comes out the smelter, it comes out as a, as a big spongy bit of iron. Mm. You've got to squash it down into something that you can then make into something. I would have then assumed, but actually, it makes sense. It's a different skill set. Mm. Um, so when we talk about the Cranog people and we and we have evidence of the smelting, that is one specific skill set. But that's not necessarily the blacksmith, mm. which leads me to the, because we use the term blacksmith. That's our term. Back then, there's a different word for it. We don't know what it is. What would be that that blacksmith specifically? If two and a half thousand years ago, what would that what would that blacksmith set up in skills? What would that mm. look like? Obviously, this might be a question we can't answer. It, it's where we start to reach the limits of um, archaeology, what it can tell us. And unfortunately for us, the Iron Age people didn't write down what was going on they didn't say oh yeah by the way blacksmiths live like this yeah um, which would have been brilliant uh and very careless of them not to have written yep, that down well, yep. um but i mean a blacksmith could be someone who was set up in a location has a workshop we do find um uh, evidence of compounds where you have multiple blacksmiths working in one place mm -hmm. that's a key distinction i always try to make actually is that very rarely would you find a single blacksmith on their okay. own you would be working in teams. The amount of work that needs to be done, especially with setups where you have bellows, um, you are the only iron workers in the area. Mm -hmm. Everyone's wanting the iron tools. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're to make anything productive at all, you need a team of people yeah. to be doing that. And they, they, that could be a team of five, it could be a team of 25, depending on the demand. Um, so there are definitely locations where blacksmiths are set up and that is their workshop, they stay there. Either people come to them or they're set up in a town or some mm -hmm. form of uh, area surrounded by uh, yeah. the rest of a tribe or so. Um, on the other hand, there is also pretty strong evidence for traveling blacksmiths, mm -hmm. those that would move around. It seems, though, that that is more in, ev uh, in support of specialists. Yeah. So someone who may be a swordsmith. Yeah. Um, there's certainly a set of Iron Age swords uh, that we can track from north wales across yep. to around about chester 
heads up into northern England on the west mm -hmm. coast and moves across to the east coast. Mm -hmm. And it's a set of Iron Age swords that are so similar in mm -hmm. art style, forging style, length, everything about them. Whether he went one way or the other, we don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it could have been a travelling swordsmith moving from chieftain to chieftain, noble to noble, working in areas, producing yeah. swords for specific clients. It's almost like kind of having, the, it's that there's the skills that everybody can do, you know, you can do X, Y, Z, start to spread that out, but then when you get somebody who's got that specific, something special, mm. they make more, they make more money, it's not money back then, but they make more, they've got more value, taking it to different points. Absolutely. Like so, could be one, could be both, and that's what we might be looking at with our Kranos. So, in terms then of what you've done today for Kelta coming, um, what's your take from from our collection, from our from our um, archaeology as a blacksmith, looking at what's left been left behind by these people? If you were to kind of take something away to kind of wrap this up nicely, what would what would you say about the Iron Age blacksmiths of potentially Loch Tay or Scotland or Britain, as it might be? Um, it, the Similarities between a lot of their work, as we say, looking at, say, the dagger and mm -hmm. find, uh, or the knife, whichever it is, mm -hmm. but finding other items from even the south of Britain, mm -hmm. um, 800 plus miles away yeah. that are similar in their own way. Um, it, an, an overriding thing with Iron Age archaeology, especially around the iron, is there's usually a lack of it. Find, yeah. found because it it corrodes it disappears yeah. into the ground so we always have to look at the um the evidence of its use yeah um and places like the cranock center where we have timbers that have tool marks yes we have holes for dowels mm -hmm. again you've got to have a metal tool to make that hole for the dowel you've got yeah, chisels yeah. or some form of uh drill perhaps an auger or something yeah, yeah um the evidence of the use of iron of tools is there um we all have the same problem though, it's always the actual physical artifacts are usually yeah. quite limited. We're incredibly lucky when we come across finds, yeah. like the dagger, like small iron pins yeah. and the like. Brilliant. Fantastic. Cheers, Tom. Thank you for that. You're most welcome. No worries. Brilliant. That was Tom and that was part of our Celts are Coming event, um, which was uh, fantastic. We've got more um, videos of that. Jason. Yeah. Have you got any, any anything to build on from what, what Tom's mentioned that comes straight off the top of your head? Yeah, I think one of the things I found really interesting about that was that just because iron is made in a certain area or produced in a certain area doesn't necessarily mean that the objects were produced in that area. They could have been produced somewhere else. And I think in terms of our collection, um, it would be interesting to analyse the bog iron or the iron pan that they were using mm -hmm. and then connect that and then do the same kind of analysis on our knife. Um, because either way, that opens up a whole new realm of questioning about where it has come from. Um, was the iron that produced given to somebody else? Was there a blacksmith somebody else, somewhere else? Yep. Um, were they on site? Um, how did they transport this huge, heavy piece of iron to somewhere else? Why would they do that? Have you not, I'm not to challenge you there, Jason, but have you not made an assumption that they're producing big, heavy pieces of iron? Well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. They might so not I be. think, I think, I think the big thing there, which I, I think Tom pointed out really well, is that the, there's no actual direct evidence of smithing at our cranos. So yeah. they might have made the iron. But was that iron transported somewhere else? Yeah. Potentially, I, I like that that question. It starts to open, you know, where is it? Um, I know you talked about doing the analysis. I know they can do analysis with copper, and yeah. that has been done in the past with, with copper mines yeah. and copper art, bronze artifacts, mm. and able to do isotopic analysis to mm. see science. People in white coats, I don't fully understand it, but they're able to, to be able yeah. to correlate you know, this copper from this item has come from yeah. this mine here. Um, I don't actually know if there's something, so I'm going to play ignorant. I should, yeah. you know, I could sit here and do my research and say that, but I don't know if you can do that with iron. So that's something that we, we I'd love to try and explore to see if we, yeah. can, we can source and answer these questions. And if it turns out that the iron isn't being made at Fernan, yeah. right next to the Cranog, that's not a bad thing. That's not a disappointment. That's yeah. a, 
that's an interesting dynamic that actually what we've got is the people in Cranog producing iron from yeah. iron ore, but yeah. then shifting that to somewhere else potentially. Or they've got the whole industry, they've got the you know the whole yeah. thing running there. And I think that's 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 an, a, a, an interesting discussion that, that, that's really come from that. Tom was very focusing on the artifact itself, and yeah. I think actually pulling in just to wrap this kind of up in a way, pulling this all together, your your approach and Tom's approach complements each other quite well because yeah. his approach is to look at the the item and what was made because he makes them, um, yeah. but that's also taking your approach of looking at well, what do you need to create that yeah. item? You mentioned before that you know they would have looked, and Tom mentioned it about they would have looked as locally as possible yeah. to find their stuff. And I think what you can do is start to fall back on itself. You know, we talk about archaeology, but is Locktay's geology yeah. actually lends itself to the fact that these Cranogs and these people are setting up here? We always think, you know, inwards, outwards as people. We think about ourselves in our house, right? What can we find as close to this house as possible? Yeah. But actually, you know, were the people in the Iron Age setting up here or setting up at Oakbank Cranog, at Fernan, and then go, right, where can we find the iron? Yeah. But actually, are they setting there because they've gone, hold on, we've got a fantastic iron source. We've got yeah. the resources. The geology lends itself to good clay for mill making. You know, yeah. and that, that's, you mentioned about the connectivity of the things. Yeah. And all of this coming together and the fact that there's so much of this kind of. Yeah. That everything. Everything is interconnected. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think we can get that just from one artifact. And I think. When people come to the museum and they see a small artifact like this, yeah. they see it on its own terms. Yeah. But it's actually not. It's actually connected to um, the wider context of community knowledge, community wisdom, uh, skill level, um, maybe connections between other cranics. These yeah. things cannot be seen individually. This is part of a wider story. And they're all kind of yeah, yeah, together, entangled together. Yeah, fantastic. So. Um, Come and see the, the artifacts at the Cranock Centre. Uh, we're open every single day, right the way through, um, from 10 o'clock till 4 o'clock is the final tour. But we have got extra events on in September. On the 24th and 25th of September, we are running the Rise and Shine Festival. We are. Which I believe you're involved in. I am. Heavily. What are you doing for that? Jason? I am doing a uh, ceremony where people become more brilliant than they already are wonderful and the whole <laughs> the whole rise and shine festival it's all about you know um, we're working with unesco rila which is the refugee integration through language and the arts and we're also working with a lot around storytelling yeah um, and for pulling in with that um with the drive for delurb going forward and our new museum at delurb this element of sustainability so it's going to be a gorgeous event over two days yeah international input which seems yeah. odd when we're such a small single site in, yeah. in the highlands of scotland there's going to be a huge international input as to into all these different facets of it so it's going to be a really brilliant event so it's well yeah. worth coming so book your tickets now and good sales man. oh absolutely yeah. book no. your tickets now yeah <laughs> <laughs> fantastic well thank you for listening and we're going to be doing a, a video podcast i think every couple of weeks yeah now um, so we'll, we're, gonna, we're trying this new format and we'll, we'll run with it. There will still be audio podcasts in between as well as we run through. But just thank you for listening. Thanks for listening.